A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Stave one, Marley's ghost. Marley was dead, to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. Scrooge and he were business partners for, well, I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole friend, and his sole mourner. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name, however. There it yet stood, years afterwards, above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grand grindstone, was Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars employed him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was a clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked to edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, upon a Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting, foggy weather. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. The door of Scrooge's counting-house was open, that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire, the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. But he couldn't replenish it, for Scrooge guarded the coal box in his own room. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! cried a cheerful voice. It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew, who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation Scrooge had of his approach. Ah, said Scrooge, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for, uh, for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I had my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a, a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, nephew, keep Christmas on your, in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it. But you don't keep it. Leave it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you. Much good it has ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I've not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I'm sure I've always thought of Christmas time when it has come round as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. Oh, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year, when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely, and to think of people below them as if they were really, really were fellow travellers to the grave, and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys, and therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good, and will do me good, and I say, God bless it. The clerk in the tank involuntarily applauded. Let me hear another sound from you, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Oh, you're quite a powerful speaker, sir, he added, turning to his nephew. I wonder you don't go in a parliament. Oh, don't be angry, uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Scrooge said that he would see him. Yes, indeed he did. He went the whole length of the expression and said that he would see him in that extremity first. But 
Why? cried Scrooge's nephew. Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love, growled Scrooge, as if that were the only thing in the world more ridiculous than a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. Nay, hey, uncle, but you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry, with all my heart, to find you so resolute. But I have made the trial an homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humour to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew left the room without an angry word, notwithstanding. The clerk, in letting Scrooge's nephew out, had let two other people in. They were portly gentlemen, pleasant to behold, and now stood with their hats off in Scrooge's office. They had books and papers in their hands and bowed to him. Uh, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe, said one of the gentlemen, referring to his list. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this, this very night. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, said the other gentleman, taking up a pen, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute, who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? There are plenty of prisons. But under the impression that they can scarcely furnish Christian cheer of mind or body to the unoffending multitude, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. You wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas. I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. Or if they would rather die, they'd better do it and decrease the surplus populations. Good afternoon, gentlemen. At length, the hour of shutting up the counting-house arrived. With an ill will, Scrooge, dismounting from his stool, tacitly admitted the fact to the expectant clerk in the tank, who instantly snuffed his candle out and put on his hat. You won't all day tomorrow, I suppose. It's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier the next morning. The clerk promised that he would, and Scrooge walked out with a growl. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a lowering pile of buildings up a yard. The building was old enough now, and dreary enough, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door of this house, except that it was very large— also, that Scrooge had seen it night and morning during his whole residence in that place. And yet, Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, not a knocker, but Marley's face. It was not angry or ferocious, but it looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look with ghostly spectacles turned up upon its ghostly forehead. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. He said, Pooh! Pooh! and closed the door with a bang. 
The sound resounded through the house like thunder. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus secured against surprise, he took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap, and sat down before the very low fire to take his gruel. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room. It was with great astonishment, and with a strange, inexplicable dread, that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. Soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This was succeeded by a clanking noise, deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks in the wine cellar. Then he heard the noise much louder on the floors below. Then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards his door. It came on through the heavy door, and a spectre passed into the room before his eyes, and upon its coming in the dying flame leaped up as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost. The same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots. His body was transparent, so that Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. How oh, now, said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. Well, what do you want with me? Much. Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? I can. Do it then. The ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if he were quite used to it. You don't believe in me? I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, <laughs> a fragment of an underdone potato. Oh, there's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. <laughs> I see. Dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth? And why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. But you are always a good man of business, Jacob. Business. <laughs> cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all my business. Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectre going on at this rate, and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me! My time is nearly gone. I'm here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and a hope of escaping my fate. 
a Johnson Hope, a Bible curing Ebenezer. You are always a good friend to me. Thank ye. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that where? Well, well, am I, am I, is that a chance and hope you mention, Jacob? I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first, and the bell tolls one. Look to see me no more, and for your own sake, remember what is past between us. It walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the apparition reached it, it was wide open. The spectre floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. Scrooge tried to say, Ham, but stopped at the first syllable. And being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the, the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, he went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep on the instant. Stave two, the first of the three spirits. When Scrooge awoke, awoke, it was so dark that, looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber, until suddenly the church clock tolled a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn aside by a strange figure, like a child. Yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium, and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white, as if with age. And yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand and in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright clear jet of light, by which all this was visible. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? To me? I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. The things that you will see with me are shadows of the things that have been. They will have no consciousness of us. Scrooge then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare. Rise and walk with me. I am immortal and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood in the busy thoroughfares of a city. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here, too, it was Christmas time. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it? Was... Was I apprenticed here? They went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried in great excitement, Why, his old, his old Fezziwig! Bless his heart! It's Fezziwig alive again! Old Fezziwig laid down his pen, looked up at the clock which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out, <laughs> Oh, there, Dick, Ebenezer! 
a living and moving picture of Scrooge's former self, a young man came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Yo ho, my boys, <laughs> said Fezziwig. No more long term night. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas Ebenezer. Oh, let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. Clear away, my fellows, and let's have lots of room here. Clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away, or couldn't have cleared away, with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would de desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book, and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it, and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast, substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers, whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In they all came, anyhow and everyhow. There were dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies, and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came when the fiddler struck up the Sir Roger de Carverley. And old Fezziwig stu stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, Fezziwig cut. Cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. Small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four, perhaps. Oh, it isn't that. It isn't that, spirit. <laughs> He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. I say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped, what is the matter? Nothing particular. Something, I think. No, no, I, sh I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick! This was not addressed to Scrooge or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect. For again he saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a black dress, in whose eyes there were tears. It matters little, she said softly to Scrooge's former self, to you very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. You fear the world too much. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off, one by one, until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. Have I ever sought release from our engagement in words? No, never. In what then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit. If you were free today, Tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? Or choosing her, do I not know that your repentance and regret should, would surely follow? I do. And I release you, with a full heart, for the love of him you once were. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you these were shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. That they are what they are, do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. Leave me. Take me back. Haunt me no longer. As he struggled with the spirit, 
He was conscious of, of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further, of being in his own bedroom. He had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Stave three, the second of the three spirits. Scrooge awoke in his bedroom. There was no doubt about that. But it and his own adjoining sitting-room, into which he shuffled in his slippers, and attracted by a great light there, had undergone a surprising transformation. Heaped upon the floor, to form a, a kind of throne, were turkeys, geese, game, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and great bowls of punch. In easy state upon this couch there sat a giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and who raised it high to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in. <laughs> Come in and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. Oh, you have never seen the like of me before. Never. Have never walked with my younger members of the, my family, meaning for I am very young. My elder brothers, born in these late years, pursued the phantom. I... I don't think I have. I'm, I'm afraid I have not. Have, have you had many brothers, spirit? More than eighteen hundred. A tremendous family to provide for. <laughs> spirit, conduct me where you will. Tonight, if, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told, and held it fast. The room and its contents all vanished instantly, and they stood in the city streets upon a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and the ghost passed on, invisible, straight to Scrooge's clerks, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled, and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinklings of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself, he pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up and rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, brave and ribbons, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence, and she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while well, Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork in the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honour of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable park. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. Whatever has got your precious father, then, said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Here's Martha, mother, said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah! There's such a ghost, Martha. Why, oh, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her. We've we did a great deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm Lord bless ye. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Alas, for tiny Tim, 
He bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been blo Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to seem disappointed if it were only in joke, so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms, while their two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off to the wash house that he might hear the puddy pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit. Cratchit. When she had rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content, as good as gold, said Bob, and better. Oh, somehow he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. <laughs> he told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon on Christmas Day, who made lame beggars walk and blind men see? Bob's voice was tremulous when he told him them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and, and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by the applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, everyone had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in stage, sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now... Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witnesses, to take the pudding up and bring it in. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding! Bob Cratchit said, and calmly, too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Then all the Cratchit family drew round, and Bob proposed a Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side, upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand in his as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob. Scrooge raised his head speedily on hearing his own name. I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, said she, on which one would drink the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. No, and nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer. Christmas Day. I'll drink his hell for your sake in the days, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not for his. Long life to him. A merry Christmas and a happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness in it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. 
The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief of Scrooge the Baleful being done with. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, as this scene vanished, <laughs> to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with a spirit standing, smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew. When Scrooge's nephew laughed, Scrooge's niece by marriage laughed as heartily as he, and their assembled friends, being not a bit behind hand, laughed out lustily. He, he said that, that Christmas was a humbug as I live. He believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece indignantly. Bless those women. They never do anything by halves. They are always in earnest. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking capital face, a ripe little mouth that seemed made to be kissed, as no doubt it was. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. <laughs> However, his, his offences carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. Who, who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Well, here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. Oh, what's the consequence? He don't lose much of a dinner. Indeed, I think he loses a very good dinner, interrupted Scrooge's niece. Everybody else said the same, and they must be allowed to have been competent judges because they had just had dinner, and with the dessert upon the table were clustered round the fire by lamplight. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, said Scrooge's nephew, because I haven't any great faith in these young housekeepers. After a while, they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. Here is a new game, said Scrooge, one half hour spirit, only one. It was a game called Yes and No where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what, he only answering to their questions yes or no, as the case was. The fire of questioning to which he was exposed elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, rather a disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal that growled and grunted sometimes, and lived in London, and walked the streets, and no, was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. <laughs> At every new question put to him, his nephew burst forth into a fresh roar of laughter. At last, the plump sister cried out, I've found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Scrooge. It's your uncle. What is it? cried Fred. It's your uncle Scrooge, which it certainly was. Admiration was the sentiment, though some objected that the reply to, is it a bear, ought to have been yes. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have drank to the unconscious company in an inaudible speech. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful. On foreign lands, and they were close at home, by struggling men, and they were patient in the greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain man and his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. Suddenly, as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck twelve. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost, and saw it no more. As the last stroke ceased to vibrate, he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his eyes, beheld a solemn fact.
phantom, draped and hooded, coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Stay for the last of the spirits. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the air through which this spirit moved it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I, I'm, I am the present in... I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Ghost of the future. I fear you more than any specter I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. Will, will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them. But there they were, in the heart of it, among the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced, to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either. I, I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first with a yawn. What has he done with his money? asked the red-faced gentleman. I haven't heard, said the man with a large chin. Company, perhaps. He has left it to me, that's all I know. Bye-bye. Scrooge looked about in that very place for his own image. But another man stood in his accustomed corner, and although the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes. They left this busy scene, and went into an obscure part of the town, to a low shop where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. A grey-haired rascal of great age sat smoking his pipe. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black. After a short, after a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with a pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let the charwoman be the first, cried she, who had entered first. Let the laundress be the second, and the undertaker's man the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance, if we haven't all three met here without meaning it. Oh, you couldn't have met in a better place. You were made welcome long ago, you know, and the other two ain't strangers. What have you got to sell? What have you got to sell? Half a minute's patience, Joe, and you shall see. What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber? said the other woman. Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed, ma'am. If he wanted to keep them after he was dead, a wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody look after him when he was struck with death instead of lying gasping out his last air, alone by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment, and it should have been, you may depend upon it. If I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe. Let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. 
Cho went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening the bundle, and dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this? Bed curtains? Aye, bed curtains. Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. These blankets? Who's else do you think? Is he likely to take cold without him, I dare say? <laughs> ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had. They'd have wasted on it, it by dressing him up in it if it hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. Spirit, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with a death. For this dark chamber, spirit, will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him to poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before them. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set them in him in the midst of them, the mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The colour hurts my eyes, she said. The colour. Ah, oh, poor tiny Tim. They're better now, again. Okay? Makes him weak by candlelight. <laughs> I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up the book. But I think he's what the... Walked a little lower, slower than he used these last few evenings, mother. I've known him walk with. I've known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder, <laughs> very fast indeed. Thank you, and so have I," cried Peter. Often, but he was very light to carry, and your father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there's your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob and his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was re almost ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon their knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if they said, Don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. You went today, then, Robert. Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I, prom I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. A little, little child. My little child. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Before I draw nearer to that stone, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or, or are they the shadows of the things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, but if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was unmovable. As ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave, his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. No, spirit, oh no, spirit, hear me, I'm not the man I was. Why show me, Liz, if I am past all hope? Assure me yet that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. For the first time, the kind hand faltered. I will honour Christmas in my heart and, and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. 
holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Stave five, the end of it. Yes, the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. Best and happiness of all, the time before him was his own to make amends in. He was checked in his transports by the churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, no night. Clear, bright, stirring, golden day. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes, who had perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Eh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, Christmas Day! It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poulterers in the next street at the corner? I should hope I did. An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now, is it? Go and buy it. Walker! exclaimed the boy. No, no, I'm in earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here. And I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's. He shan't know who sends it. <laughs> it's twice the size of Tiny Tim. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did somehow and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. It was a turkey. He never could have stood, stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped him off short in a minute. Dressed Scrooge dressed himself, all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth as he had seen them with a the ghost of Christmas present, and walking with his hands behind them, Scrooge regarded every one with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir, a Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge said often afterwards that that... Of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, these were the blithest in his ears. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock, but it, he made a dash and did it. Fred! Why, bless my soul, cried Fred. Who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in. It was a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. If only he could be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. And he did it. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past... No, Bob. Bob was a full eighteen minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open so that he might see him come in. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on a stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello, growled Scrooge in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of the day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are, yes. I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It, it shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Scrooge continued, leaping from his stool, and therefore I am about to raise your salary. 
Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. A Merry Christmas, Bob! A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl, Bob. Make up the fires and buy a second coal scuttle before you dart another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived in that respect upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well. If any man alive possessed the knowledge, may that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, every one.